So let's keep playing with the role playing, but we're going to take it in a new direction this time. What I'm trying to do is show how all these threads tie together. You're fighting a war, you're training every single minute of every single day. And that's way greater than any good work that can be done. And the, the irony of it is, is that you are measuring performance. It's just that you're always going to be failing. And you can't say that when you do good performance that, you know, you can rest on your laurels or it counts before God. Because that's not the reason for the performance. The reason for the performance is to learn him. I mean, you know, you're living, you're breathing now. Don't you want it to be worthwhile to breathe? Being worthwhile to breathe has nothing to do with good works, even if you're doing them. The whole purpose is to know God. And that's what's essentially wrong and different between Satan's system and God's. Satan's all about good deeds as if that were the proof of something. It's not. It's not even a means to an end. It's, I don't know what you want to call it, a, a thread in the, a process of knowing. You have to practice what you know in order to really know what you know. When you learn piano, you can't just learn it in your head. You have to practice it. And you don't really know piano until you've practiced it a lot. That's what John is talking about in 1 John when he says practice righteousness. Okay, I'm not, it, it's, it, the Greek verb is poieo, and it means to do, to make. And I think the NASB at least translates it practice righteousness, which is really the way it ought to be translated when he's talking about it. You're getting practice in righteousness. It's a way to know God. That's the reason to do it. That's where performance matters. That's why the kingship matters. That's why everything matters. I mean, you're breathing. Why are you breathing? Are you breathing so that you can do a good deed and call yourself a little goody two-shoes? If that's your motive in life, then you got a sorry life. And that is the lifestyle and the thought pattern of, of most everybody. Everybody's being, you know, driven by, led by the nose. Oh, I gotta be good, I gotta be good, I gotta be good, I gotta be good. That's the very essence of the sin nature. So it's all about you and how good you are. And not at all about God. So look at how clever this, this real plan of the spiritual life is. You're playing a role for a goal to be a king. And, you know, to the world standard, that sounds all, you know, haughty even. Or at least high status, because that's all the world knows is status. It gauges everything by status. The world has no clue about intrinsic value, no clue about God, no clue about relationship. Everything is measured by performance in the world and status. And that's why all of our relationships are so shallow and dysfunctional. We can't enjoy a good relationship. We really can't. The sin nature wrecks it because it turns everything into some kind of performance status criterion of good deeds. If I'm good to you and you're good to me, we'll say we love each other. And it's all a pile of crock. Because the minute you stop doing good to me or I stop doing good to you, oh, well, you don't love me anymore. Or I don't love you anymore. Or I lost my faith. And I was never loved to start with. At least not for you. I was love for what you did, what you do for me, what I do for you. It's the activity and the goodies that get love, not the person. Okay, well, see, that's what God undercuts. This whole system undercuts it. And see how ironic it is, because his will is that you become a king. Okay, but becoming a king means it's a savior type role. You own it all, you take care of it all, it's saviorship and it's a kind of parenting. And just as when Christ was down here training for it, it took him 30 years to train for the cross. He wasn't respected, he wasn't doing anything. Name me one work in the Bible that he did, even one. 
We've been down that road before. I hope you remember from the earlier episodes. And we're going to revisit the question again in episode 12. What work did he do? None. And yet at the same time, there's nothing harder than what he did. Okay, so now let's role play that. We talked in the last increment about role play from the standpoint of a sort of structural metaphor. Okay, role play in the sense of kingship. You're thinking of it in, in this sort of par- paradigmal. Because, I mean, it's actually literal, but, you know, you're a royal family of God and you're training to be a king. You know, you can be born in a royal family, but that doesn't mean you rule. Okay. You have to be fit to rule. Well, that takes a lifetime of training. Or if you don't like that analogy, you can think of it as a CEO. Or or you can think of it as um, parenting. Or you can think of it as programming. Or you can think of it as, you know, um, planning your day. Or how do you structure where everything is in your house so that you can find it. Make it procedurally efficient. Okay? Those are all big picture design questions. And they require a great deal of um, mental activity. It's very grueling mentally. Because you're constantly monitoring yourself. You're treating yourself like an employee or like an object. You're monitoring your strengths and weaknesses. Am I sinning? Am I being tempted? Do I need to use 1 John 1 9? I'm writing this email. Dad, what should I be thinking when I do it? What should I be writing in reply? Because everything's a royal function. And you're on divine television. So, that part we covered. But now we're going to look at a different aspect of it. If this thing is a training for kingship, but the world has this problem of not being able to enjoy relationships because they're all hung up on performance and status, and it's actually the performance and the status that the world loves, not the person doing the performance and having the status. How, if this is the goal of God in our lives... Isn't he basically catering to Satan's good deed standard as evidenced in Matthew 4? Now watch this. Let's just look at it for a minute from almost the same standpoint as you would as a soldier, which is the other structural thing that I brought up in the last increment. A soldier has to train to instinctively do hard things to do with a great deal of technical expertise in seconds and without having to think about it because he's going to be in war remember the backdrop for this is the upcoming war that means he has to think clearly that means he has to keep his weapon clean that means he has to take a great deal of care with all the logistics in his pack in his movement in his action with the team There's a great deal of performance that's absolutely vital to surviving. And so they train and train and train and train and train. Same thing for an athlete. Same thing for, you know, ballerina. Of course, that's a type of athletics too. You have to go procedure, 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 procedure. Repeat, 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 repeat. You can never, you can never stand on your laurels. Okay, you practice, a good athlete will practice six hours a day. And the same thing with the person in any kind of field. You practice, practice, study, practice, study, practice, study, practice. Well, it's even more true in the spiritual life because you're becoming a spiritual surgeon. You're becoming a spiritual ruler. The content of the rules of the kingdom that God wants you to have is forged from your head. He's developing your head so you can make the rules. Well, but how are you going to make the rules? You first have to know material to know what kinds of rules to make. What things are important, what things are good, what things are bad. There's a whole lot to learn. 
And then you have to decide, well, what am I going to do with this information? And it's a lot of trial and error, and it's a lot of, you know, you have to learn by doing. You have to get the information first, and then you learn by doing. And you practice first on yourself. How do you govern yourself? Okay, so that much I've already covered. Now we're going to fold in this new angle to it. Since the emphasis on a daily and practical basis still ends up being the familiar performance and status criterion, it's real easy for the old sin nature to take over. And you'll think you're doing it in the name of God and you're not. The whole focus in the litmus test here is motive. Why are you doing it? You're not going to be competent if you're not doing it because of God. If you're not doing it to learn God. God himself. Personal. It's personal. It's real important. If you're a Christian and you're doing the Christian shtick so that you can think of yourself as a good person, you are carnal, you will never grow up, and you do not know God. The difference between childishness and maturity is the, the nature of the interests, the nature of the motive. When you're immature, it's all me, 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 and how do I look, and all this insecurity that goes with that. When you're mature, it's he, 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 he. It's the other person. Your own opinion doesn't even mean anything to you. You just care about the facts. Well, that's something external to you. Whether you're right or wrong is really kind of unimportant. You need to know if you're right or wrong so you know how to course correct. That's about all that matters. And whether somebody likes you or not, well, you know, you're glad if they do. But if they don't, well, too bad. That's maturity. And, of course, it's gradiated. Okay, but right along inside there, notice that your attitude toward yourself is you're, you're treating yourself as an entity. Whatever's good about you, you acknowledge, and whatever's bad about you, you acknowledge, and you're always trying to hone your skills. And so it, it looks like it's performance and status. As a method of gauging skills. You're not doing it to think well of yourself. You're doing it because it's just sheer training. Okay, but all that emphasis on performance. The sin nature is going to glom on it. And say, I'm a good person if I did this thing right. When you hit a good kill shot in racquetball. Oh, I did that good. I'm good. Because I did a good thing. No, to two are totally divorced. What you do or accomplish or think is really a product of things outside you. So it's not you doing a good deed and therefore you are good. You got the grace of being able to do a good deed. And it's a product of a whole lot of other people besides you that it even gets done. And you get to have the glory and the enjoyment of doing it. But your actual ability to bring it to bear is a product of a whole lot of other factors. You know, when when two enemies clash in a war on the battlefield, okay, they're dependent on the camp cooks, they're dependent on the people who did the weapons cleaning, they're dependent on the terrain, they're dependent on the weather, they're dependent on their generals. So when one side wins in war, it's because of a whole lot of other people being involved, including the failures. You can't win a war against an enemy if the enemy doesn't fail. See, so it's totally arrogant to say, I did a good thing. No, you didn't. A good thing was accomplished through you, through and, and it required, you know, millions of things in order for that perfect storm to occur. Okay, so one of the other things that ends up getting involved here is what about the way God treats you? See, if it can't be about your performance and status, then it also can't be about God's performance and status. In other words, do you love God because of the way he treats you? That was the argument Satan was making about Job. Oh, Job is only nice to you and praises you because you give him goodies. Okay. And God said, what? 
Okay, well then with all the goodies. You know, same thing with Abraham, same thing with Gideon. All the Bible heroes went through these dry phases. Okay, where they didn't have the goodies. And the idea was, you know, the people themselves. We don't know if our love for God is encumbered with, you know, what do you want to call it? Do I, does, it's this, you know, the classic story. Poor girl marries rich guy. Does she love him for his money or for himself? And frankly, what you find out in the spiritual life, just like Abraham did and everybody else, is that this problem of the relationship with God, you can't grow. You can't handle it. In fact, you can't stand the relationship based on goodies. It'll never work. He's too rich. It's too much of an obstacle. He's too rich. He's too good. He's too perfect. That's a problem. So his wealth, his attributes, everything about God is too high. So do you love him in spite of that? See, what theology is always dumbing down God. Theology is always cutting God down to size. I mean, the Calvinist and the Catholic theology are just totally insulting about God. I mean, somebody should just throw away the Westminster Confession and they should throw away the Catholic Encyclopedia, particularly the Unicity definition. Oh, God is diminished? If he's not one? That's what the Koran says. How can the Catholics be so dumb to leave that in Catholic encyclopedia? Proves they don't know a thing. And of course, all the church fathers are dumber than, you know, spit. They wouldn't know God if he bit them. In some parts of City of God, Augustine started to get a glimmer of the idea. And hopefully, you know, before he died, he got some. But I mean, they were arguing the most puerile questions and thinking the most puerile ways. And the Calvinists were no better. Westminster Con Confession is a travesty. Absolute travesty. They don't understand Trinity to save their lives. They really don't. And they certainly don't understand God's nature. God is constrained by his attributes? Excuse me? God cannot sin? Well, then he's not omnipotent, dummy. Of course he can sin. If you're going to say he's omnipotent, that means he can sin too. That's part of power. The power to sin. The fact that he doesn't use that power is a whole other story. But to sit there and say God cannot sin? Somebody should just flunk you in theological kindergarten right away. Even a brain out knows better than that. Okay, so God is a problem to have a relationship with on a relationship basis because he's so much higher than you. How do you talk to him? How can, you know, he's big, you're little. How can you have a relationship? How come he's not bored out of his mind? That's my question to him all the time. But he's not. Why is he interested in us? Like David said, who's man that you're mindful of him, that you think about him? I don't know why Psalm 86 just came to mind. Maybe that's where it's located. Psalm 86? I don't know. I'm talking off the top of my head right now. He cares. Because he just does. Because he likes it. See, that's arbitrary. That's the whole theme of this episode. Arbitrary. Okay, so arbitrarily, God is going to treat you in ways that should not result in you still loving Him. Because human love, see, this is what it's the proof that the love that you get for God is, is coming like it, like it says in the Greek. Um, the love for God. Okay, the Greek word is agapao. It's God-level love. The distinction between God-level love and human love is human love is conditional. God-level love is not. So God removes the conditions. That's what the story of Job is about. 
That's what the story of Abraham was about. The big hickey in the relationship between Abraham and God was Abraham wanted a son because that was the promise of the son, the Messiah, to come. And God made him wait. But wasn't Abraham faithful? Well, when he wasn't being a putz, yeah, he was faithful. I mean, he was a putz sometimes. Goes around giving away his own wife, pretending she's his sister because, you know, he wanted to protect his own hide. And she was must have been some kind of looker because when she's 90 years old, he's still giving that argument. And that's when Abimelech took her. She was 90 years old when that happened. So he wasn't, you know, Mr. Holy Man. Yeah, he was interested in God and he ran around the territory that God said he was going to give to Abraham and his descendants. That's how he lived his life. And he talked about God incessantly. And he was on a first name basis with God, total conversational basis with God. Total familiarity. Read how he talks. He's not using holy language. He's not saying, oh, our five our fathers. And, you know, the, 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 the incantations that the Jews usually use. Baruch Adonai Eloheinu. You know, that kind of nonsense. He was on first name basis with God. Talked to him just like he talked to any human. Yeah, because he knows him so well. God removes the conditions. Do you love God because he's him? Or do you love him because of his status? Or do you love him because of what he does for you? And frankly, this is the big thing for all of us, okay? When you really start to love somebody, you don't think you do. When you really start to love somebody, you doubt your ability to perform. You think you're not good enough. And no matter what you give up or sacrifice, it's no sacrifice at all. You didn't do it well enough. You're anal against yourself. Because you love. Whatever you love, the object is getting all the attention and you just wish you could do more. And whatever you're doing is not enough. In your mind. Okay, well, because that's true, you don't know that you love God. Because you're busy telling yourself it's not good enough. So he has to take things away or give you too much of something in order for you to realize how much you love God and that it's only Him. And of course that demonstrates to Satan and company the same thing. So what he do does is he merges your dream come true, which is Him, and your worst nightmare, which is also Him, through circumstances which also amalgamate your personal dreams come true and worst nightmare. He unites them. So that's the role play you need to do also. Role play in your mind. What's my dream come true? What do I care about the most about God? And what bugs me the most about Him? Because He's going to merge them. That's where your spiritual life is going to go for you personally. Your personally tailored spiritual life. That's how He's going he's to take you. That's the path He's going to put you on. And we're all different. We share a lot in common, but... You know, we don't we don't learn at the same pace, we don't learn the same things the same way, we don't we don't see things from exactly the same perspective, even when we have a lot in common. And he, it's personal. It's personal down to the smallest detail. So he is going to eventually unite, put in your life a kind of treatment of you that you know comes from him. Either by allowing it to happen or just causing it to happen. Prosperities that you think are too high for you and unfair. And then the flip side, adversities, which are too low for you and, and unfair. And it's always this battle, because it's always off kilter, because you're sitting there having this kind of unrealistic view about what you're going through. For the longest time, the pieces don't fit together. It's like being in CIA training. They put you through the ringer. It's soldier training, too. 
You're you're always off balance, and you're supposed to be. It's to teach you're always there's always this tension, and you're supposed to always be under tension. It's the same thing in physical exercise. You're supposed to exercise to the point of failure. So you go over and over and over to the point you can't do it anymore. And then you feel bad about the fact you can't do it anymore. And then you beat yourself up and you use one John 1 9 because you're not supposed to beat yourself up. And then you do it again. Meanwhile, your circumstances are going to hit you from all directions. My pastor classified this in eight different classifications and I can't remember them all now because I haven't thought about this in a long time. But basically it's like people testing system testing disaster testing thought testing those are four of the eight testing the quality of your thinking when you're under pressure command pressure in particular command pressure means can you think under pressure well what kind of pressure pressure of fear pressure of guilt pressure of, of being you know um, deprivation these are all things they train you in CIA training too because what if you get caught? I mean, they're, you know, the whole, most of the CIA work is not spies. They just read newspapers and gather intelligence that way. It's very, you know, droll. But occasionally you have to go undercover. And you better be able to withstand. And they don't really use the torture method that much to get information out of you either. They don't need to. But still... You have to be able to control your mind. And what happens if you're deprived of sleep? What happens if you're deprived of food? What happens if you're deprived of companionship? What happens if you get too much companionship? What happens if you get too much sleep? You get too much food. You get too much prosperity. You get too little. How, you know, putting you through the paces so that the idea is that it's always God first, in your head, instinctive, just like a soldier loading his weapon. You're fluent in that thinking. Just like a soldier on his weapon, a person playing piano, somebody doing good ballet. Whether you just been told you got cancer, which God can take away at any moment, or whether he just dropped a billion dollars in your kitchen. You can go either way. You know, it depends on what your soul needs to train. I don't know what my soul needs to train. Neither do you. You keep on trying to figure it out. Because, you know, it's it's part of your, your, your piece of equipment as far as you're concerned. If you're thinking rightly about this, you're just a piece of equipment. But you don't put yourself down either. You have to be objective. Here's where I'm good. Here's where I'm bad. Here's where I'm performing well. Here's where I'm screwing up. Every athlete has to evaluate himself like that if he wants to be a good athlete. Well, this is spiritual athletics. And then God throws this stuff at you. Something that's totally destabilizing. And Job is a good example of that. He took everything away from Job. Never even told him why. As far as the book goes, the book doesn't record that God ever told Job why God did that to him. So, you know, tomorrow you might get news that you got cancer. Or tomorrow you might get news that, you know, you have some great, 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 great aunt who, you know, had a ton of money that it went through, you know, it had, the, you were like the 16th beneficiary in line, but the first 15 died out. You're going to know that's not a coincidence. Now, how do you handle all that money? Well, you better learn. Because, you know, being a king is a problem of wealth. Your essential problem in spiritual life is how do you learn wealth and how do you handle it? And it's a lot harder test than having nothing. Actually, both are wealth tests. When you have nothing, you have a wealth of nothing. Having a wealth of nothing is not too d different from having a wealth of something. But the having the wealth of nothing is a lot easier to think out. Because you get then down to the basics. You know, how do you eat? How do you sleep? How do you pay the rent? But when you have a wealth of some things, and you got all this money, and you can do anything with it, how do you spend your time? I mean, it's real boring to buy things. And you can't solve the problems of the world by throwing money at it. That's the next thing you find out. 
The problem that the world has, the world doesn't want to learn. The world just wants to go, you know, with the least common denominator and resents anybody who doesn't go in the same direction. So wealth is actually a pain in the neck to have. Because you have all this seemingly, you know, good stuff that you could do something with, but you can't do anything with it. It's really annoying. So what are you going to do? Buy your 16th Maserati? Well, maybe. Maybe God wants to teach you something by, by you buying a Maserati. Well, of course, just like everything else, you go to God and say, Okay, I got all this money I can't spend. But if I buy a Maserati, then the people who spent the time building the Maserati, their salaries get paid. And it's mostly low-paid people on anything that's made. They're getting paid. So at least, you know, I'm putting food on their table, even though I don't need the car. Should I buy a Maserati? Well, maybe the answer is yes. You see, it's it's always thinking, 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 thinking. And it's always destabilizing. And it's always like, you know, I shouldn't get this. It's too bad, it's too good, it's too something. Why is God doing this to me? And he's going to do that to you. He's going to do things to you, or let things more likely, happen. Orchestrate the natural stuff in such a way that it's used for training. And it's always going to be unfair. Because the essence of human love is this tit-for-tat thing. I do for you, you do for me, we love each other conditionally based on what we do for each other. Okay, well when God doesn't perform, what happens? What's your attitude then? He's not performing if he's doing something that's too nice. And he's not performing if he's doing something that's too nasty. Or letting it happen. And there's all this need to like assign a cause and a blame. Oh, this bad thing happens to me. Did I do something wrong? Not necessarily. That was the problem in the book of Job. Job's clueless friends, except for Elihu, who wasn't really his friend, it was just coming along, the young guy, fourth guy talking. His other three friends were totally clueless about God. Oh, you must have done something wrong, Job. Something bad happened to you. It can only mean that you're a bad boy. And then, you know, Job is saying, no, I'm innocent. And they're saying, you're being prideful. You're just not admitting you did something wrong. A typical Christian. Okay? And that's, those are the steps you go through. Well, something bad happened to me. What did I do wrong, Dad? And it's the right question to ask because, you know, we're always doing something wrong. But that's not why the things that happen to us happen to us. Even if it is our fault and even if it's, you know, our own stupid decision that caused it, he's going to use it for training. If somebody does something bad to you or you made a stupid decision yourself or it's something like just like freak, he's going to use it all to train you. And if it's freak that it's too good or, for, for, you know, you did something good, you made a good decision, you get all this prosperity as a result. Or somebody else just does it for you. And you get all this prosperity as a result. How does that destabilize you and what do you think? Do you get too much into the thing and how good or bad you are? Or how good or bad someone else is? Or how good or bad God is? Or do you recognize that, hi, this is training. What am I learning about you, Dad, through this experience? Hi, I walk into the doctor's office for a routine exam and I find out that I got lung cancer. What am I going to do in that situation? See, that's soldier training. That's programming. That's the what if of a design. You know, what if the program goes in this direction? Okay, well, what programming do we need to do if it goes in this direction? Okay, what if you got a billion dollars? Parenting is like that, too. What if my kid does this? What if my kid gets cold? What if it's 50 degrees outside? Do I give him a scarf when I, you know, take him to the bus? All those what-ifs. You have to plan them, and you have to train them, and you have to practice them. Just like practicing piano or any other kind of job. 
So that's the role playing you do. Okay, what if God gave me cancer? What would I think? What if God gave me a billion dollars? What would I do? And you're planning all these contingencies. And then any of the contingencies that occur, even if they're not the same as what you role played, they will have enough characteristics in common with what you did role play. So that it, it's like a soldier who's who's trained, you know, or a, f a pilot who's trained in those little jumpy cockpits. You know, there are these machines that a pilot gets into. They're totally on the ground, but they're on these stilts. And it gyrates around, and you're supposed to guess what instruments to push, and how do you get your big 747 out of a stall, or your fighter plane, you know. It's like, it's it's practice. Okay, so that when you get the real deal, you're familiar with the ins and outs and ups and downs and your own feelings that are going to interfere. And, you know, because you're a human being and you're going to react. So if you've practiced it in advance, the what-ifs, then the actual what-ifs that happen are going to have something in common with the what-ifs you practiced. And therefore you're going to have a sort of set of, of reactions and instincts. My pastor called this doctrinal instincts. That you say, okay, yeah, this reminds me of that training scenario, this thing, that thing. You know, you, you when you pick up a machine gun or, or an Uzi or, you know, uh, a, a gun of any kind, there's certain similarities that all guns have in common, even though each gun is wildly different in certain ways. But if you've handled enough guns enough times, if you get a new one, you're going to have more more readiness in being able to handle it. It's the same situation. You role play. What if God did something to me, X, or Y? What would I think? That way you've practiced thinking it through. Even, you know, you practice movements with your body, and your body remembers. And your body can identify similarities. Well, so can your soul. See, the objective is to get familiar with the ups and downs of life. So that the thinking toward God is always in control. The thinking toward God is always in the driver's seat to interpret and color, you know, your own reactions. It, it, there's never such a thing as pure, and God doesn't even want it that way. He wants everything to be knit together. Just like the temple veil. All these threads and they're all knit together. And he's literally knitting together the procedures and the ideas in your head every time you practice. Now, notice you really are fighting a war. You're battling yourself. Okay? So when the real war comes, and it will, your brain has gone through the paces and the paces and the paces and the paces. And you will be a person for the crisis. You will be used one way or another, either visibly or not, to win the war. And the 99% of humanity who are clueless and want to remain clueless, they're benefiting from you. They're, they're, they're going to be saved because of you. I don't necessarily mean save like in salvation and live with God forever, but save from harm down here. It'll either lessen, or it'll change direction, or it'll disperse, or it'll be diluted, or something. And they may or may not know that you had anything to do with that, but you'll know. So that's this other element of war and role play. What if God did X to me? What if God allowed X to happen to me? What would I do? And it doesn't, you know, you're going to be kind of at a loss for words and you're not even going to know how to think about it. Keep asking the question. And talk to God about this, you know, because He knows what you need to role play. And generally speaking, it's going to be stuff that you want to least think about. Least admit. You know, we all have certain ideas in our minds about things we want that we think we shouldn't get. What if we got them anyhow? And, you know, you can want something that you shouldn't get that's good and nice. 
Okay, but if you really got it, you'd really be flummoxed. And the same thing, of course, is true at the negative side. You know, you lose a leg, you can't talk, someone you love dies, someone you love gets meningitis or, you know, Epstein-Barr. What do you do? This is what a soldier has to do. He has to do a lot of what-if planning. This is what a programmer has to do, a parent has to do. A ruler has to do. You can't make rules if you can't if you don't figure out all the what ifs. So you got to walk through them. So that's the point of this audio: is that role play the various things that that well, what if God let this happen to me? Whatever this means, X, and then substitute Y and substitute Z and try. It's going to be hard to do this. Focus on the things that bother you the most because they're too nice or too nasty. So that you get familiar with those what ifs, because the what ifs are going to turn it, are going to be very much like the real things that hit you, and you need to prepare by learning how to think about them in advance. Not so much for the purpose of performance, but because you want to train your brain to think toward God first and have a familiarity with it, so it doesn't knock you flat. And you get so disoriented or, you know, demoralized, you quit the spiritual life. Because that's what people do. They don't want to learn the Bible. So when something hits them that's too nice or too nasty, they just quit. And they'll slap God's name on whatever they do as good deeds in order to tell themselves that they're spiritual. And it's a big lie. Do you want to be like that? I bet not. So start role-playing. What if God did this to me? Talk to God about what kind of role-playing you ought to do. Because each one of us is different. The only thing I can say that we all have in common is He's going to unite your dream come true, all of them, to your worst nightmare. Christ's dream come true, what was that? To be one with Father, that's John 17, and to save mankind so we could be one with Father too. That's also John 17. And where do you have to go in order to do that? The cross. That's his worst nightmare. Imagine how repugnant that was to him. And he's constantly surrounded the whole time he's training with idiots who hate him, who don't understand what he's saying, even when they're positive. And the apostles were constantly misunderstanding what he said. And he kept on saying to them, you know, ask for the Holy Spirit. And they didn't. They were a collection of losers, those guys. And they're therefore representative of the entire human race. You had hot-headed Peter. You know, you had little timid John. He wasn't so timid by the time he wrote, for, you know, the Gospel of John. You had money-grubber Judas, who valued his own, you know, ego in terms of how much money he could have. That's where all greed comes from. Self-image with money. You know, it's kind of hard for me to say off the top of my head, you know, what were the hang-ups of Matthew and Mark and Luke. Of course, Luke came afterwards. And hang-ups of Paul were that he wanted to convert the Jews, so God denied it to him. And yet nobody wrote more eloquently about how the law was upgraded in Christ than Paul. So he gave Paul his wish, just in a different format. That's the idea. You use everything you want out of this life, he's going to give you. But he's going to unite it to your worst nightmare. He wants that tie. And it's a real, that's the hardest way to have a relationship with God. Is he wants it to be all encompassing, all the high and all the low. In you. With him. Intimately. That's the hardest thing of all. He's God, you're not. How can this kind of relationship exist? How come you don't quit? That's what the angels are busy craning their necks to look at us about. How come we don't quit? We're supposed to curse God and die, but we don't. How come? Because he's not being fair to us. On purpose. He wants us to live by God's standard. This is Satan's big argument. 
You give the humans, you tell them they can't sin. They're not allowed to sin. That they go to hell for not believing in Christ, not due to sin, because he paid for sin. But at the same time, you know, sin is sin. We're not allowed to do it. Okay, but everything about us is sin. We program our own sins. You're, you're born with a perfect soul the minute God imputes it to that body that exited the womb. And about five minutes later, you're crying in a situation God would never cry. Well, hello, you're a baby. Of course you're going to cry. Okay, but it's still wrong. Because it's not something God would do. So now the first sin has entered your soul. And, you know, all your feelings, therefore, start to control you. And you don't have a vocabulary yet. You don't have any way to defend against the sin nature's urges. Sin nature urges like an urge to go to the bathroom. How do you defend against it when you're a baby? You can't. So see, God's being unfair from the get-go. You're supposed to be perfect? How are you going to be perfect? How did Christ stay perfect? That's a conundrum theologians have been trying to figure out for centuries. You see, if this is an impossible story here. God is not treating us the way we need to be treated because of the weakness of the human condition. He's expecting us to behave at his level. I mean, you have to argue that he's right to do that because he's God. Why should he put up with less? Okay, so how is the God level even achieved in us puny earthen vessels? Huh? If Christ in you is the confidence of glory, Colossians one twenty five through twenty seven, that beats Satan, and that's what that that verse section says. God running the show in you, the thoughts are God's own, are Christ's own inside your head, and yeah, you're limited and you're sinner, but those thoughts are still God level. And do they stay that way? Do they accumulate? Do they get more and more sophisticated over time, which is spiritual growth? Does your whole way of thinking convert from the me thing and the body thing and the behavior thing and all this puerile, parochial, me, my, my family, my mother, my father, my sister, my job, what I like, what I want, my opinion? Does it convert out of all that childishness into... What does dad think? Okay, father wants this, so this needs to be done. Father wants that, so that needs to be done. Christ said this thought, so this needs to be done. Total analytical, totally objective. And yeah, you still have your own thoughts and opinions and desires. And they conflict and sometimes and often as you grow, they will agree. But your decision-making process is based entirely on God. Not, con you know, it's consistent. Doesn't mean you don't fail. But it's like, you fall, you get up. You fall, you get up. You fall, you use one John 1, 9, you get up. And it becomes a pattern. Bang, 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 like firing a weapon. And then you're winning in the spiritual life. But you won't think that's what you're doing. You're going after a goal, Philippians 3, 14. That's what you're thinking. But that's not what everybody sees. And when I say everybody, I'm talking about the unseen. Because they actually know what's going on. You don't really know what's going on. The people around you don't really know what's going on. You're in the middle of a firefight down here. Of course you don't know what's going on. You can't see the whole big picture. But you can know the big goal. Then you're plotting. Catasco, pon, dioco, ais, to, braven, te, sano, clesius, tu, te, un, Cristo, Jesus. That's Philippians 3.14 in my badly pronounced Greek. Plotting. Okay, but God's seen the whole battlefield and He's pleased. Holy Spirit's running the show. You you got smoke all around you. You can't see the battlefield. But everybody else sees that. And the people on the ground, they don't know what they're looking at. But God sees it. The elect angels see it. The demons see it, and they're busy trying to stop you from thinking that way. And so you really are fighting a war. In this time, with emphasis on, well, what if God treated me unfairly? Unfair too nice? Unfair too bad? 
So role play that with God and, and hopefully that will help you get a better handle on what I'm trying to get at here. Peace out.